And um, the, the Thanksgiving story is one that as I've gotten older, I, I get to love the story more and more. It is a fantastic adventure story. It's a story of people of tremendous courage, tremendous vision who took very great risks and gambles and blessed you and I and all true Americans, blessed in ways that we've forgotten and ways that we need to remember. A picture that's by my side, some of you may recognize, is a small version of the picture that is in the rotunda here, not so far from where I'm standing. The picture, it's called the Pilgrims at Prayer. And uh, I'd like to talk to you about this little group of pilgrims that came over and gave us our Thanksgiving, the particularly famous Thanksgiving that took place in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Uh, there was an earlier uh, Thanksgiving in Virginia. This particular uh, group of pilgrims, though, gave us a lot, lot more than Thanksgiving. So while it is the Thanksgiving season, I think it's appropriate to think a little bit about their great example to us because it is the principles and ideas of people like this that we need to reproduce and we need to follow their example as we move America forward in the days ahead. So let me uh, start by saying, first of all, who were these pilgrims that we talk about uh, that were at Plymouth and uh, that, that gave us Thanksgiving? Who were the pilgrims? And um, they were really a couple of groups of people, but about half of them, and some of the very influential ones, were called separatists. Um, they were what you might call in their day sort of the evangelical Christian types of, of England, except that they were a little bit of a weird uh, subset in this regard. They had listened to the writing of a Scottish theologian that followed Knox, and about the 1580s or so, and he started finding in his Bible this interesting idea that the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, or for Jewish people, the Torah, there seemed to be a distinction between civil government and church government. Now, that may seem very obvious to us today, but in those days, if you recall, there was um, a king half the time running the church and the church half the time running the kingdoms, and the two were very much inter connected and intermixed, dating back to the time of Charlemagne. But um, they came up with this idea that the Bible seemed to indicate that there was a difference between church government and civil government, and they got that from looking at the story about Moses. Uh, but Moses was like the civil authority, but uh, he had a cousin, uh, or I mean a brother, uh, who was, um, was running the worship service, uh, Aaron. And uh, so they saw that example, but then there were other examples uh, that were less known. There was a guy, Uzziah, who was a king, and he went into the temple and started burning incense and and because he thought he was uh, was able to do anything he wanted. And a couple of courageous priests stood up to, to confront him, and uh, he started to stick his finger at him and give him a lecture and say off with their heads, and he looked, and his hand was covered with leprosy. And so there were these stories where you have particularly the, the story of Saul, the first king, where he offered the sacrifice and Samuel read him the riot act, said, you've really blown it now, buddy. And so you have these examples in the Old Testament where civil and church government were separate. So these these guys, the separatists, had learned from their uh, scripture and had decided uh, in their day that they didn't want their church to be run by the king of England. This was following old Henry VIII, who had separated the English church from the, the church in Rome. And uh, these guys decided what they're going to do in, in Scrooby, England. They decided that they'd get this manor house. They'd all get together and worship and, and start their own little church. And the church wasn't under the king. It wasn't under the king's thumb. Well, as you can imagine, that did not meet with the approval of the king. And he says, Arr, I'm going to harry them out of England. And so these separatists were... Uh, were given uh, all kinds of very tough treatment, fines and taxes. Their wives were put in the stocks and made fun of and all kinds of difficult things so that these separatists couldn't really live in England and they couldn't have their little church that they had started or series of churches. And so, as uh, you know the story, they moved to Holland where they could have freedom to start their own church. And uh, so they lived in Holland for some time. It was a difficult existence. They had to work seven-hour days and many, many hours, uh, I mean, seven days a week and many, many hours a day. Uh, very, very difficult economically for them, but they didn't complain and they were able to have their church worship service the way they wanted. And that lasted for some period of time as these separatists were in Holland. But a couple of things happened that 
convince them to look around at, at something else. And the main thing was that their children were picking up some bad habits from the Dutch kids. And they didn't like that. They had come there because they had some very strong uh, theological beliefs about what was right and wrong. They were worried about their children uh, in the culture in which they were living. And so they cast about uh, for what God would have them do. And so the picture that is printed, uh, it's a, a wonderful painting. It's uh, uh, about 10 by 20 feet in the rotunda. This picture depicts uh, the key turning point for a bunch of these separatists. And this is in the town of Delfthaven. And if you take a look closely at the picture, certainly you can't see it here on the camera, but it says Speedwell. That's the name of the ship. And these are the separatists gathering together at Delfthaven in a, a farewell to their pastor, John Robinson, who they loved dearly. John Robinson was a very even-tempered, uh, peace-loving man. He had almost risked his life a number of times uh, trying to separate groups of, of different Christians that were fighting each other. And um, he had the, his parishioners said that he had the wisdom to see trouble coming and to steer his little flock away from the trouble. So they loved John Robinson. He is now preaching his last sermon because he will not go with the pilgrims to America, but instead will stay behind with the, the members of his, his church that were still going to be back in Holland. And so as you can imagine, if this is your last time and you have all of these friends who are going on this absolutely incredible expedition to plant a plantation in the middle of the wilderness all the way across the ocean, you're going to give them your best shot. You're going to talk to them about the things that you think are most important. And so in this picture here, we have a, a recording of, not in the picture, but but we have a recording of what he was preaching about. And he, first of all, bewailed the state of the Calvinists and the Lutherans. And uh, he said, for though Luther and Calvin were bright lights in their own day, yet were they living today, they would readily embrace the additional truth that God is breaking forth from his word. What, they were say what he was saying, in effect, was that um, our understanding that we get from the Bible uh, is not static. It's something that moves over time. And as people learn lessons from history, we should learn from them and we should uh, continue to learn the additional thing that God is going to teach us in practical sense from his Bible. In a sense, uh, his idea of the Bible was it was a gold mine. It was full of truth. And as men over time read it and understood it, they could improve the lot of civilizations. It turns out that this was a pretty good theory in all practical sense, whether you happen to have any interest in theology or not. It turned out to be a pretty good theory, and you'll see why in just a few minutes as we follow this little group of people on this incredible adventure story. You have to think about this. When people came to America in Jamestown and other places, it was men. They came here to some degree to say they're going to spread the light of Christ to the heathen, but mostly they were looking for gold. Uh, that's what the history books show us. But this little group of people were different. They were going to take their wives and their children on a one-way trip across the North Atlantic to try to plant a civilization. And they were doing it not as a bunch of dogs that had their tails tucked between their legs because they'd been chased out of one place and chased out of another place, but with a, a, a vibrant vision of a challenge to build a new civilization based on new principles and new ideas. They wanted a change from the European civilization because he said, this is um, Robinson goes on, he says, now, when you go to this new land, be very careful what you adopt as truth, saith he, for it is unlikely, essentially, that a Christian civilization can spring so rapidly out of such thick anti-Christian darkness. He was talking about Europe and how Europe was very resistant to ideas that the Bible would suggest were a good way to do things. And so he was saying, now when you go over on this great expedition, be really careful what you do, because how you set things up is going to be very, very important. And you don't want to set it up just the way they did in Europe, but continue to use the Bible as the blueprint. 